welcome to My Podcast Knows What You Read in the Dark, a book club podcast made by chaotic people for chaotic people. I'm Caitlin. I'm Kristen. I'm B. And I'm Liti. And we are four friends here to tell you what's what about the books we read and loved this month or the books we hated this month. Since we decided to split the episodes up like part one and part two, for our listeners, it will be basically two weeks between the first episode and this one. But for us, it's been like 10 minutes because we're recording it all in one sitting. So <laughs> yes. while we're still like thinking about beginning of the year kind of stuff, and we were talking about did we reach our Goodreads goal for last year? I want to know, like, are you planning on setting a Goodreads goal for 2023? What is it? And I know, Lady and B, you set page goals last year. Are you planning on doing that again this year? Yeah, definitely. I don't know what I'm going to do for the books because I'm always afraid of setting a goal that's too high and never reaching it. So I think I'll probably set at least 60 again for the books or 75. And the page goal, 20k, was perfect, so I'll keep the 20k. I think I'll keep the books goal. Probably keep it at 52. <clears throat> I don't know about a page goal. I think it fed too much into my anxiety, because the way Storygraph parses it out, so, like, you have to, you know, like, how many you should read per day, and it was, like, 67 pages per day or something like that by oh, the time yeah. I had the goal. And so it was like, oh... Like, you only need to read this many pages to be caught up. And it was like, oh, ugh, nah. No, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I... I mean, it does it with the books, too. But, like, the books, you can kind of, like, especially if your goal is, some like, something a little bit shorter, it works out. Yeah, the, the pages one, because if you weren't reading, like, 67 pages a day, you were getting a little, you know, line below your goal saying, like, oh, you need this much to catch up. But I don't think I don't... I don't know if I'll do a pages goal. That's so stressful. That pressure, even if you know that, like, because I'm not a person who, like, if I'm reading a book, I will, like, sit down, read that book. I read pretty fast, so, like, say it takes me a day or two to finish it, and I maybe won't read another book for, like, four or five days. And by that time, yeah. the, pa the page goal would, like, put me so behind. It would stress me out. Exactly, yeah. And that's, yeah. that's kind of, like, the book goal is fine, if you, especially, like, I did 52, so it was, like, you know, roughly one book a week. If you're a week behind, it's like, hey, you know, if you read one book, you're caught up. It's funny, Storygraph does it well where it shows you your your book and page outcomes like month by month. And like January of 2022, when I read the entirety of the Captive Prince series and all of the short Hell stories, yeah. January is like up here at 15 books. No joke. <laughs> and, and, and then February tanked and was like two books, you know? Yeah, the book one, it's like, oh, you're a book behind. You're like, whatever, I can do that. But when it's like you're 973 pages behind, you're like, um... Ow. Yeah, I think the reason for me that the bo the page count does not bother me is because I read a lot of audiobooks because my job allows me to. So since I'm always reading an audiobook, like the page goal for me is like super easy. Nice. That's why it doesn't bother me as much. I don't prefer it to the book goal, but at the same time, it gives me a better idea of what I read than the book goal because the book goal, sometimes I read 15 Ice Planet Barbarian books in a month. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's like one of the books that counted for me last year was actually just a short story. It was, um, it's called As Yet Unsent. And it's literally just like a collection of some extras that are in the back of Harrow the Ninth. And like, definitely not even what I would consider a novella. It's literally like a couple of chapters, but it, you know, counted as a book for me, even though it definitely wasn't. Yeah, one of my books, my shortest book of the year was 20 pages because it was a like extra epilogue that was included like if you signed up for someone's newsletter oh yeah <laughs> um so yeah but i don't my like i said my goal i'm like lady like i hate to set it too high and then i never meet it but i, th I think i'm gonna set it at 75 Ooh. and go from there let's both do 75 let's do it yeah we can, we can do, do it like, come on. And I never really set a page goal. I hit 34,000 pages this year. Jesus. Ooh, which, like, I, that's insane to me. Um, but it um, is. especially when you consider, like, how many kind of short books I read. Because I read a lot of, like, romance books, which tend to be a lot shorter than fantasy novels and stuff. But, yeah. So, I like I said, I don't really set page goals. But I may set one for this year. But... I don't really know what I want to set it at because I'm going to try to read more audiobooks this year just because 
I feel like I ingest the story a little bit better because I'm like forced to really listen to it, but we'll, we'll see. I was going to ask you, what's your longest book that you read this year? Is it, it's probably House of Sky and Breath, right? Well, it's actually not, but it's really? not really fair because the book that's actually my longest book, I didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> because like, you know, when you mark something as read in Goodreads, like, yeah, it, it kind of counts it as a read book, which was the book of Azriel, um, which was one of the worst books I read this year. This book is longer than Sky and Breath? Yeah, it's 890 pages. What? Oh my god. Yeah, and it's um incredibly boring and bad for all of, well, I'm assuming all those pages. I made it about 150 before I had to put it down. But, but yeah, it is longer than Sky and Breath. So I'm just going to assume that I didn't read anything else that was longer than Sky and Breath, and that was technically my longest. I think my longest book was Unequal Affections by Laura Ormiston. Um, it's a Pride and Prejudice retelling where Elizabeth accepts Darcy's initial proposal instead of re rejecting him the first time. And they like, it's basically... Oh, no. Yeah, it's um not bad, but it was just, it went on too, like, too long. Some of it, like, there were parts of it where I was like, this could have been over 100 pages ago. It was only 400 pages, which is saying something, considering... Ah. Yeah, too long. I forgot that this year, for the book club, we read that KF Breen Sin and Chocolate book. No. And I went through and I read the entire series. Now you have to live with that decision. Yeah. You absolute mad lad. I have to live with You that. have to go to your grave knowing that you read that whole thing. That you did I that. Did. You spent life minutes on it. You did that to yourself. You did. No one no one forced you. I did do it to myself. I was like, I'd be reading and be like, why am I doing this? And it was like one of those I had I just had hope. There were so many like loose ends. It's because you needed to you needed to report on the gyrating. Uh, that was true. The mm -hmm. the use of the word gyrating in sex scenes. <laughs> no, but it, part of it was like better writer could have tied together a lot more. And so I was like waiting for that. And in my head, maybe I was like forming different loose, like tying up different loose ends in certain ways and make, making it work and making it. <laughs> and it didn't happen. No. Talking about KF Breen. Uh, yeah. I know. I was, I was just going to say, I was like, speaking of KF Breen. <laughs> <laughs> in our first episode, we talked, or mainly me, I guess, talked a lot of shit about book talk. And I don't want anybody to think that it's unjustified or that I'm being unfair. <laughs> So, we're going to talk about and this isn't even the this isn't even the book talk book that broke the camel's back. This was like the first straw added to the camel and we just went downhill from there. So, I'm going to talk about A Ruin of Roses by KF Green. <laughs> My beloved. <laughs> My beloved. No. It is book number 1 in her deliciously dark fairy tale series. It is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. That's, it's a, it's a, I'm sorry. It's a dark retelling of Beauty and the Beast, but her interpretation of dark and other people's is, um, vastly different. So, oh God. So last month, my clues, I don't know if anybody remembers, but my clues, I was thinking of either bringing period drama or uh, magical realism was the other one. And the book I was thinking about bringing was The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley, which is one of my favorites. But it's impossible to talk about. So I was like, to me right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was like, we could have something good and now you're just going to torture I my know. ears. <laughs> but this is, I don't know where the thought process went from there because I was like, okay, well, that book's impossible to talk about without sounding like a lunatic. So let's talk about this absolutely fucking terrible book instead. So I'm sorry. I don't know where my brain was at, but I, we wrote with it. I have so many notes. Y'all know me. I do not prepare a lot for anything i fly by the seat of my pants my entire life i have so many notes about this book i'm 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 so scared but also excited yes <laughs> i want to learn more about this bad book yeah okay so the story follows a woman in her early 20s named finley uh she lives in a village in an unnamed kingdom if it is named i cannot remember what the name of it is uh, but she lives with her father, her older brother, Hannon, and younger siblings, Sable and Dash. The kingdom where they live was once ruled by a character who's only referred to as the Mad King. And it's like an offhand kind of comment she makes 
that uh, he made a deal with a demon to settle a personal grudge. And basically the demon, when the king died, I don't remember if the king died or if the demon killed him, but regardless, king died, demon took over the kingdom, and now has cut off the world from the magical, the rest of the magical world. And apparently things like running water and electricity, which is so fucking wild because... It is a a buckwild plot point to put in a fantasy to begin with. You could have just like included it. I mean, it's your fantasy world. You're making it up. If you want them to have running water and electricity, who gives a shit? Like you made it up. But then it gets she adds an even more buck fucking wild layer to this already crazy plot point. She says specifically that they don't have these things. And then later on, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I just can't help it. Later on, when Finley goes to, like, the Cursed Castle, they talk about vibrators. What? Yes, which run on batteries or electricity. Like I remember <laughs> you telling this to this, a chat uh-huh. one day. Yes. She explained, like, it's explained away by the use of demon magic. Oh, no! Oh, wait. <laughs> they at one point had electricity. <laughs> it was taken away by the demon king's, like evil dastardly plans and then they realized that they weren't gonna have vibrators anymore so the demons made magic spells that make these like basically sticks this is like bad religious subtext like i'm (laughs) like is that a message here like did a mormon write this i'm just really confused (laughs) they really needed vibrators for the hysteria you have to understand yes apparently otherwise the women would be hysteric their uterus would just be like floating around everywhere but they're powered by demon magic. Is demon yes. magic? Yes. Okay. Anyways, I'm I'm getting off topic. We're okay. Demon king cursed everyone, cut them off from the world. That's where we're at. Okay. No power, no running water. No power, no powered, running water. Yes. No nice. power, powered vibrators. Okay. Feminism. <laughs> the people in this world used to be shapeshifters. Um, they did have magic before the curse happened, um, but because of the curse, they are cut off from being able to communicate with their, like, inner animal and from being able to shapeshift. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So no electricity. No electricity. No running water. No running water. No shapeshifter. No shapeshifter magic. magic. Yes. But let's just, we'll just pop a pin in that uh, not being able to communicate with your animal, um, because we're going to come back to that fairly quickly. (laughs) Another side effect of this curse is that it causes... um, kind of like a wasting disease, basically. Um, It doesn't really go into much detail, but it's just basically like the curse is making people sick. There's not really anything that can be done about it. But Finley, because she's the protagonist of a fantasy novel, has come up with some kind of fancy elixir that slows down the, uh, the progression of the curse. She calls it the nulling elixir. It's made from a plant called Everlast, which um, I can't remember the exact particulars, I, but I think it like it only grows in the forbidden forest because fucking of course it does it's a disney retelling come on yeah seriously the forbidden woods are forbidden because the other thing is like the demon king does not allow people to travel between like villages he's trying to keep everybody like isolated and the forbidden woods are patrolled by a beast this is like i don't even know how to describe this to you guys in a coherent way so i'm I'm gonna try the book starts with finley already in the forest collecting the Everlast leaves that she needs, right? While she's in the forest, she comes across a birch tree that starts, like, shivering, shaking. She refers to it as also dancing. It is fucking insane because this is where her weird-ass inner monologue starts. Oh. I saw so many people on Goodreads and on Amazon that were talking about how funny and quirky her internal monologue was. Uh oh. It's so bad. But I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let y'all make your own decisions. So please give me an example. To set the scene again, she's in the forest alone at night, she hears some weird noises and she suddenly comes across this like tree that is like shaking like none of the it's not wind, it's literally like the whole trunk leaves, everything is shaking. She says on separate occasions, these are separate lines from different pages, what in the double fuck is up at that tree? Mm. And I only knew that Birch was a diva fuckface looking for attention. What? No. No. Oh, wow. I'm busting a gut. Yeah. That's so funny. Can you imagine, like, thinking to that to yourself? I No, because I'm not... 
an idiot. I just, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if people read a different book. Than I me. I think like, so too. Like, did you? Yeah. Are you sure we read the same book? Like, you didn't get lost on your review. Yes. Journey. I didn't write it down in my notes, but this is also whenever she starts. Like, she talks to an imaginary audience in her head. Like, there's a part where she says something about like dropping her knife, and she's like, "We're in trouble now, folks." And I'm like, "Girl, you have to stop." It's so annoying. By the way, um, that stupid ass birch tree, that's an important thing. I need you guys to also put a pin in that and remember it because we're going to come back to that too. So the birch tree draws the attention of the beast. While she's running from her life away from the beast, she suddenly gets inexplicably incredibly horny. Okay. Or, of, of course she does. <laughs> now, to give her some credit, she is also like, what the fuck? Why am I so horny right now? Okay, so she's not like, oh, this is awesome. That, I hope that doesn't awaken something. No, maybe. no. The <laughs> shit is not like that. Thankfully, she is questioning it. But it is also so wild. It is explained. I mean, the explanation is implied later. Something like animals in heat and her inner animal and their- Babe, you hit the nail on the fucking head. <laughs> no, is this an ABO book? I think it might be. Oh, mm -hmm. gross! Yeah, um, if it's not, it's it seems that way. So, she gets, like, super inexplicably horny. Um, she narrowly avoids escaping the beast patrolling the woods because the beast is, like, the ten his attention has been drawn by the dancing, like, birch tree. So, after this encounter in the woods where she almost gets eaten, that's, like, chapter one of the book. She goes home. We have all the exposition chapters to tell you the history of the kingdom and about her family, which is everything I just told you to kind of set up where we're at. Um, this is where two of the worst worst quotes in the book are oh no you guys have heard one of these because i could not stop myself from sharing it but there's another one and i didn't realize how bad it was at first blush because i'm just gonna read it she's talking to her brother and her brother says something and the like dialogue tag says hannon asked sitting in the wooden chair opposite me he'd made it what she's talking about the chair he made the chair yes he made the chair who cares why would you why would <laughs> Why would you what? put that? It's not important to the story. In the dialogue tag? Yes. Yeah, like, what? <laughs> Does he want a medal? I, I don't <laughs> understand. And it it doesn't have any relevance to the conversation. Doesn't have any relevance to Hannon. It doesn't have any, like, and that's that's the only line about that chair. And then she goes on with the conversation. Like, she needed to meet a word count or something. Yes. And then we have... <sighs> Probably my least favorite quote from the book, which is... Um, I'm not ready. Yeah. So she's, again, talking about her brother. Um, he liked to get to know a lady before progressing to the next level. Because of that and his stout frame and gingerific good looks, oh. he did seem to get to the next level, parenthetical, banging no. every time he put the effort in. Oh. <laughs> Rip out my ears. I don't want to I don't want them anymore. Oh. It's literally in parentheticals in the book. It's banging. banging. Yes. And also gingerific. Also, it's her brother. Her brother. Why would, do you know that? Man, her writing would gag a maggot. <laughs> yeah. I, I swear. Where the story really kicks off, Finley's father has the sickness that's caused by the curse, and he starts taking a turn for the worst. So she is forced to go into the Forbidden Woods again very shortly after the trip that she had in the beginning of the book, where she encountered the weird fucking birch tree and the beast. She sneaks out of her house in the middle of the night after telling her brother and her siblings that she wasn't going to go to harvest the Everlast. Yet again, this weird ass birch tree starts freaking out and making a bunch of noise. And I want you to remember that I said it was important. So obviously, again, it alerts the beast. The beast shows up while she's harvesting, if in her nightgown, if I remember correctly. Oh, sure. Oh, my of course. God. Surprise, surprise, the beast shifts into this very scarred, like, very naked man, and that is Nyfane, the main guy. They proceed to have the most buck-fucking-wild first interaction I've ever seen between two characters. He's doing the whole beast spiel of, like, you're trespassing. You have to come be imprisoned in my castle. Like, typical Beauty and the Beast shit. Again, out of nowhere, she starts getting super fucking horny. Oh, no. She's going into detail about all these, like, lustful feelings she's having. While admittedly, she is, again, being like, what the fuck? Why am I so horny? He says to her, they have literally said ten words to each other at this point. He says, do you want to be dominated, Finley? Your animal certainly does. 
No. Uh, <laughs> restraining order. <laughs> Sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> wait until I read this next line because <laughs> that's gonna make that comment even better. <laughs> oh no. They proceed with this like weird like lustful interaction and like the thing is is like this is all happening in her head. Like it is not like they're talking lustfully to each other. They're like inexplicably drawn until the point where in the middle of the night in this dark forbidden forest like while she's stealing from him he gets a full on erection. Oh no. <laughs> like sir this is a Wendy. Yes sir this is a Wendy's. You can't just like pop it out here in the open. <laughs> his woods his wood. You're done. <laughs> I'm out. I'm banned. <laughs> Cancel. So this is what happens when we split into two and we're here for two hours instead of one. Yes. <laughs> this is where she like does one of her uh stupid ass like comments to an invisible audience. She says, Desire warmed my body. What the fuck is happening, folks? This shit is no good. Girl, stop. That's all she says. That's she's that saying much? that in her head. Yes. She's like talking, like breaking fourth wall, kind of. I thought I, I hate thought this the girl. First sentence was what she said and i thought the second sentence was you no. with commentary no. but it's all her it's all her that's word for word oh. from the book yeah so it's during this like wild conversation slash like sexual assault that nyphane reveals he charmed the birch tree to alert him specifically when finley was in the forest just her? Just her. Okay, creep. Okay, Edward. Yeah. <laughs> he, like, says it's because, like, he's seen her harvesting the plants before, and she doesn't just, like, steal from him. Like, she harvests and cultivates the plants. Like, he can tell that she's taking care of them. So, like, it's not explicitly said, but it's almost like he wants to know why she's doing that. But it's not done well. <laughs> Yeah, it's just kind of creepy. Yeah. But that's also why she got super, super horny when she was running from her life because he was nearby because he's the beast. So that's just like his thing. It's like her animal reacting to his. Oh, okay. After this weird moment passes, like their weird sexual tension moment passes, she stabs him. What? <laughs> Uh, she tries to run away, but he stops her by saying that he knows that her brother has also trespassed in the field and he'll forgive her brother's crimes if she agrees to come back to the castle with him, which she does because she does not want her brother to suffer for his crimes and her crimes. She reveals that the reason they've been stealing the plants and why she cultivates them so carefully is because she makes that nulling elixir that stops the effects of the cursed sickness. And he didn't even know that was possible. So that's another reason that he wants her to come back with him is because he wants to not make it. So he transforms in the beast and takes her back to the castle. By the way, I'm almost done, but like, I can't leave out any part of this insanity. How are you almost done? Nothing happened. I, I know. No. Oh, this is a, a bullet point I have like maybe two lines from now. They don't have sex in this book, which is so wild. And they talk about anal so much in this weird ass book. Yeah, that's the book where they talk about anal and spit roasting, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Oh my God. And they literally they don't at all. They don't. They don't have sex at all. It really reminds me of Sin and Chocolate, that other KF Breen book, where it's it just feels like a prologue. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing was like a long prologue for whatever was next. Yeah, there's four books in this series. Oh God. They go back to the castle. The castle's filled with demons, so that the demon king can keep an eye on Nyphane and the humans that still live in his castle, which are just his servants. And when they get to the castle, they're having. A giant fucking orgy with all of the humans in the castle and other demons. Because apparently at night, Nyphane doesn't have control of the castle anymore. The demons can do whatever they want. And whatever they want is to fuck constantly all the time. The servants. The servants. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds um, very consensual. So uh, supposedly is. Yeah. Okay. But I'm going to put big, thick, heavy quotation marks around consensual because they also talk about the fact that, like, the succubus magic, like, invades your mind and makes you want to consent. So... Yeah. Uh, uh, me no like A little questionable there. Yeah. Looks questionable to me. <laughs> Nyphane leaves her in the care of the butler. I think it's Hadriel is how you say it. Um, I'm assuming he's supposed to be, like, Cogsworth. Um, if Cogsworth liked wearing purple like dinosaur costumes and getting fucked what the yeah what oh my god are you sure this wasn't a fever dream that you had it might be 
But I did go through and, like, look at the book again, and these things did happen. So. Oh, God. He, like, dumps her in this room and has um, Hadriel come up. Hadriel, I fucking hate him. He's the worst character ever. One, he's so annoying. Like, she tried very hard to set up this banter between him and one of the other servants that's, like, Finley's lady's maid. But it's just annoying. It's not funny. And it doesn't, like, feel natural at all. And also, he just seems like he's supposed to be, like, a slutty gay stereotype. It's amped up so, so much. So, like, within 10 minutes of Hadriel meeting Finley, he tells her if she's going to be trapped, they need to get her the demon vibrators. Of course. And explains that they're powered by demon magic. Um, And then asks her if she's into butt stuff. Bro, read the room. Read the fucking room. Like... (laughs) And like I said, this book talks about anal so fucking much. And it is mentioned way more times than is warranted for a book where they don't even have sex to begin with. Yeah, really? The next day, she, like, goes out with Hadriel and he tells her that, like, she can't go out in the castle at night because the demons basically run the castle and blah, 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 blah. He tells her if she does want to go out at night, the only safe place for her to go is to the salon. Finley assumes he's talking about a hair salon, and he says, no, not that kind of salon, love. He said, it's not for the hair on your head, it's for the lady beard. He pointed at my crotch. (laughs) You could go in there and get shaved, and it's super delicious and erotic. It's not. I mean, like... Um, no. Let me tell you, I have never once thought either of those things while doing that act. (laughs) Like, delicious? Delicious and erotic. Mm. And then it says, then... If you want, you can round it out with a little meow meow. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I feel like I just got assaulted. It's a microaggression. Yeah, I think he's like trying to imply that the demons will eat her out after they shave her. Because it's like the demons do it. That's the that's what the salon okay. is. Yeah. Weird kink, but okay. Yeah. He tells her she can't go out at night. And he also tells her, and this is the worst foreshadowing I've ever seen. He tells her. Everybody is, like, trapped in time because it's, you know, Booty and the Beast, and that's one of the plot points. And no, that means nobody can get pregnant. Only the master, Nyfane, can impregnate someone, and then only his true mate. Who do you guys want to fucking guess that is? Uh, oh. I, who who could it be? Who could it be? It's probably Hadriel, right? Yeah. The birch tree only dance for <laughs> it's someone. The tree. Yeah, it could be the birch tree, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read the other books yet, but, like, I promise you... There's no way that that's not a major plot point in the series. Like, she's going to be pregnant and their baby is going to defeat the Demon King or some fucking shit like that. I'm I'm not an expert in ABO, but I think that's basically what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. So the deal that she makes with Nyfane is, like, if she shows him how to brew the nulling elixir and care for the plants, because she's learned through, like, trial and error, he apparently has knowledge passed down from, like, his family. She agrees to teach him how to make this nulling elixir if he allows her to access the knowledge he has about the plants and to use some of the plants, the ones that she's been stealing from, and he'll let her go. The whole, like, pretense of how Finley is at the castle, how a new human is at the castle, this is what the the human servants and Nyfane are telling demons, is that she was caught stealing and Nyfane is keeping her for his own entertainment before he kills her. So every time a demon catches them out together, they have to, like, play act at non-con. Oh, fun. Oh. They're so bad at it because they both get super into it immediately because they're hot for each other. It is insane. Um, again, I repeat, I would like to reiterate, despite all of this shit happening, they do not have sex. Every time Finley is within two feet or I would say 10 feet of Nyfane, she gets super horny and has to comment on it. And being near him has apparently brought her back in touch with her shifting animal. Like, she can't shift, but she can talk to her animal. So that's added a whole other element of the internal monologue that makes it unbearable, is her talking to her animal, and then also still talking to this imaginary audience, and the animal commenting, like, who are you talking to? Oh. Really wish I was kidding or exaggerating. Her uh, animal has some buck wild shit to say. It's like, basically, her pick-me-girl slutty alter ego. Ugh. Yeah. This this line, uh, the animal is talking about Nyfane. She doesn't care that he's nice, or if he's nice. It says... Fuck nice. I have a dark and damning need for that alpha. I want to take a running leap, wrap my legs around his head, and force feed in my pussy. This bitch needs some cock. Wham, bam. Call me ma'am. 
no. Oh, no. Not the one, ma'am. Call me, ma'am. Where? I forgot no. this. Where do I even it's begin? It's so bad. Are we still doing smash or pass? I'm going to pass. Yeah. You can, like, hardcore pass. <laughs> Bunch of stupid shit happens. They have all these tense encounters, but don't have sex. Finley ends up one day sneaking into the sealed off part of the castle. Because again, it's Beauty and the Beast. There has to be a sealed off part of the castle. And there's a rose bush in there that is partially dying. And she pieces together that Nyfane is the missing dragon prince, who's the Mad King's son. And the Mad King is the one who got the demon involved in the first place that ended up taking over the whole kingdom. Nyfane wanted to marry someone for love, so he ran away, but it broke his mother's heart, and she died, essentially. And when Nyfane came back for the the funeral, that's when his father made the deal with the demon to, like, keep the whole kingdom trapped, basically, and to keep Nyfane from leaving again. And then, obviously, that backfired on him, because he's a demon. So, he ended up losing control of his kingdom, and now the only thing keeping the Demon King from completely taking over the kingdom is the fact that Nyfane is still alive. I can't remember, but I think like there's some clause basically that says like the Demon King can't harm the members of the royal family directly or what. It's, again, exposition and world building that's not set up well or really needed. No one asked for this. The sad thing is like the story that she's attempting to tell could be really good if she knew how to yeah. do it. Like as you were explaining like all the stuff that happened with like the deal with the demon and stuff, I was like, this could be a really, really good story if the right person wrote it. Yeah. Because like the the that premise of like Nyfan wanting to marry for love, running away, his mother dying because of his actions, so he comes back and his father makes a deal to keep him there, that's a good premise that's a that's a pretty good setup. Great yeah. story. It's a great plot. Execution is a fucking we're not even at zero, we're at negatives now. Yeah. So after she figures that out, Nyfane like storms in she and him have an argument. She runs away and ends up back in the Forbidden Forest. He saves her from getting attacked by some other type of creature. I don't even remember what it is because it's not relevant. He gets hurt. She nurses him back to health in her village with the, like, elixir that she has been developing. And the book fucking ends with him leaving and going back to the castle. Oh, That's it. Okay. That's the plot of the book. Well. Wow. It is all to set up what is going to happen in the subsequent books. Wham, bam, call me ma'am. Wham, bam, call me ma'am. Zero out of five stars. Yeah. Zero out of five stars. Just terrible. It's horrible. Horrible. It's horrible. And y'all, y'all, this book has a absurdly high rating. Okay. On Goodreads, it has 3.86 stars out of 32,000 ratings. Jeez. And then on Amazon, it has 4.3 stars out of 20,000 ratings. Oh my god. Yes. I am not joking when I think everybody reading this book except for fucking me is off their fucking rocker. They have to be. Yes. Yes. Only 1,353 people who have rated this yes. one star. Yes. It's insane. Well, I'm glad that there's 1,300 people on the planet have sense. who know what a good book is. Yes. This was a, a book on Book Talk that everybody was like, oh my God, it's so good. It's a dark fairy tale retelling. And the, the sexual tension between the two leads is so great. And I read it and I was like, I think all of you collectively need to go to therapy. I'm worried about you. What's dark about it? Yeah, I'm gonna say, what's like, what are they considering that's so dark? Because it's sexy? Yeah, because it's sexy. Oh, okay. okay. She's making it dark because there's demons and a bunch of crass sex language and sex stuff that happens. It's not dark because it deals with any kind of like dark themes. The darkest thing outside of like the sex stuff that's in there is the stuff about like people getting sick and dying from a curse. And that's about it. And so that's like every other fantasy book you read anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, A Ruin of Roses by K.F. Breen is fucking terrible. Book Talk is lying to you. Don't read it. Five out of five. <laughs> yes. Five out of five stars. Would recommend to hell. <laughs> Jump off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kristen, you want to take the reins and bring us back down? Well, we are going to come back down as per, you know... Just me as a person. I'm going to talk about a book that is all that's considered dark academia again. Ooh. 
I don't think that it is. It, it could be depending on how you look at it, but this one's a lot more disturbing and heartbreaking than the one I talked about on the last episode, but it was the best book that I read this year, and that is These Violent Delights by Mika Niemerever. I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly. And um, I, when I read this book, I fell kind of head first into it, and I, as soon as I picked it up, I could not put it back down. In the same way that I kind of fell in love with If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio, which if you know me at all, that's my favorite book in the whole world. These Violent Delights kind of like grabbed me by the throat and wouldn't let me go. Like it's like really dark and twisted. And, and the best way I can describe it, it's like it rips you into pieces as you're reading the story. It weaves you through this tale of like obsession and love and heartbreak and grief, like all together. And it's like really beautifully told, even though it's like a very dark story. So this book is narrated by Paul and he is a freshman at Pittsburgh University in the 70s and his father has just died by suicide um so he's kind of reeling from that loss the time this book begins and when he meets another boy whose name is Julian they very very quickly become completely like enraptured with each other they spend every waking moment together they have classes together at their college they start hanging out outside of school. They, I mean, they do everything together. And the thing that kind of draws them together initially is that they're both really, really intelligent and they like to kind of rile each other up with these deep, long-winded discussions about like right and wrong, good versus evil, ethics, any kind of thing along that spectrum. It's what draws them together and keeps them together because they kind of mesh on this intellectual level and they they both have this idea in their minds that they're smarter than everyone else around them they're pretentious in that way which if you don't vibe with that kind of thing you could easily hate both of them a whole lot and so kind of as the book goes on they end up becoming intimate and become boyfriends and at one point julian corners paul um and he says something to the effect of like I don't know why you haven't tried to kiss me. And this is like pretty early. This is probably like 20% in the book. And then as that happens, they kind of go on from there and end up really becoming an item. Hell yeah. Yeah. And like, there's a line about halfway through, um, there's a part where Julian has to go back home and he's like from a different area. And I, I apologize. I cannot remember where he's initially from, but he goes back home to his parents' house. And so they're writing letters back and forth. And Julian is writing this letter to Paul and Paul thinks in his internal monologue, he says, all they were or all they had ever been was a pair of sunflowers who each believed the other was the sun. That's beautiful. Yeah, I really like that. It is. And like the whole book is like that. It's just like this beautiful prose about like how much they mean to each other. and They just gravitate towards each other. Like their whole entire world is the other person. That's kind of the problem um, because... Like I said, you know, this book's all about obsession and everything, but this book shines in two very distinctive ways. The first is that it kind of takes unreliable narrator to like a completely new level. And kind of what I mean by that is like Paul has extremely crippling depression and very low self-worth. And so because of this, like he's always questioning how Julian feels about him enough to where like you as the reader also question it like there's a lot of times where you are so deep in Paul's mind that you believe that there's just no way that Julian is authentic and that you know there's just no way that he could ever love Paul the way that he says he does and the reason that you think that's because Every time Paul describes Julian, he's like beautiful, charming, intriguing. Like he's Paul's antithesis because he's the complete opposite. So it's like you never really get a full picture of Julian as a whole because he's kind of looked at through rose colored glasses. And even Paul too, because he sees himself the complete opposite where he's like ugly and lowly and boring. And like the only positive thing that he feels about himself is that he knows that he's smart. Other than that, like, he has no positive thoughts, which, like, I don't know, as someone who's, like, lived in Paul's shoes and still does from time to time, like, it was really hard to read yeah. um, because his internal thoughts were, like, they echoed my own. And so it was, like, it was, it was really hard. But I think a lot of people, particularly young queer people, would understand 
these feelings and these thoughts because you know you tend to question people's devotion or feelings towards you when you live in a headspace where your opinion of yourself is low and and keep in mind this is in the 70s so like things were a lot different back then in regards to like sexuality and mental health you know they were kind of living in a different time you know especially like with men like men were not open about how they felt and they didn't tell you things like it's just it was a lot different yeah the second thing i loved about this book is how it takes queer love and makes it feel more toxic like and dangerous because <laughs> you know how there's like this joke about like u-haul lesbians like paul and julian are like that um they as soon as they meet each other it's like at the hip they are so obsessed like they and they are toxic like toxic 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 to the point like you don't even know how they can kind of stand each other because it's like they love to pick little fights and I think a lot of times, like, when you read LGBT books, like, people are afraid to touch that with anything but kid gloves. They just think that it needs to be handled very delicately. Yeah. And Mika did not do that in this book. And I don't know if you guys know, but Mika is actually trans. I think that he felt like he could tell the story um, the way he did because he's maybe, you know, like lived this kind of story before. I don't know. I just would like to see more books like this because, you know, you see all these like straight stories that bend the rules and, you know, are like considered dark romance and they're toxic and bad. I think everyone here loves a good toxic relationship. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, like, like in, in their fiction, right? Like not in real life. But you have to kind of bend and have to read like a heterosexual story. But this was not like that. It was very different. And so I like that. I would love to see more books on that spectrum because I want my toxic relationships to expand all across the proverbial rainbow, right? Everybody should Yay. get a taste. They should. They should. I hear a lot of times like people just talk about how especially lesbians get into like very toxic relationships and stuff. So it's just like you don't have to handle with kid gloves. You can just tell it like it is. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that for so long, like queer stories that we hear about have been written by not queer people. And so now that queer people have a little bit more of a platform, they're afraid to like touch those toxic relationships. I think so. Most of the, at least the mainstream stuff that we see is always like, positive stuff positive stories about queer people i think that might also be publishing it kind of might feed into like yeah probably too it's very like cutesy and like polished over but like people forget representation doesn't necessarily mean like positive not in the way people are thinking negative like people are thinking negative when i say that as like bad representation and i mean like every range of the experience of someone should be able to be represented. So if you're in a toxic relationship or a relationship that is maybe abusive and you don't know it or is or is abusive and you do know it and you need to get out of it, it's like you should be able to watch a character's growth and change experience in any type of like relationship or situation in all sexualities because that's like the human experience. It's not polished. Right. Uh, something that people tend to forget to with like... I mean, we shit a lot on book talk and stuff like that, but like people will disregard books like this because they're dark and they're going to call them problematic. But at the same time, I haven't read this book, but I don't think you're meant to romanticize their relationship. You're not. You're not. I, yeah, you're not meant to be like, oh my God, I want to be like them. Like, no, it's the story about an abusive relationship, a toxic relationship. It like, is. It, it's, it. it's not being presented to you like, this is the ultimate love story. It's like showing you like how deep and dark like a relationship can be and what it can lead you to if you aren't careful. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of an alternate universe Victor Vale and Eli Cardale from Villains by V.E. Schwabs. Yeah, yeah. This, this relationship of like, we're super smart and we're better than everyone and it just like goes super toxic. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think where the problem comes in like is that people tend to... I don't know why, because I've never been this kind of reader, and I know you guys aren't either. They go in to a book expecting, like, the morality to be, like, spoon-fed to you instead of looking at it, like, going in with your own established set of moral principles and applying, like, learning something, seeing a different perspective, that kind of stuff. Yeah. People are like, this relationship is toxic. Why are you reading this? It's like, 
it's supposed to be toxic. Like, it's not supposed to be good. Right. It's supposed to be representative of a different lifestyle. The book shouldn't have to tell you that it's bad for you to know it's bad. You should be applying your own morality to the situation. Right. Exactly. Use your brain and use some critical thinking. You know, that's very scarce right now. Can't believe you would even suggest that. I know. How awful of me, right? So, yes, as the book kind of goes on, Paul and Julian's family are kind of suspicious of what they, you know, they think they might be together. And, you know, obviously that's very frowned upon um, in both of their families. And so, like, they're, they're, they're kind of trying to keep Paul and Julian apart, but they, you know, keep making up excuses where they're going and they end up meeting together anyway. And when this book kind of reaches the precipice, Paul and Julian are in this phase where they're kind of trying to prove just how devoted they are to each other and like what kind of links they would go to show each other how much they care and love them. Julian especially, because Julian at one point says to Paul, you know, like, I don't know what you want me to say. I don't know what you want me to do to prove to you that like, I'm devoted to you. I love you. Like, you know, what can I do? And so not to spoil anything, but like what they end up deciding on is an act of violence. And despite the kind of fact that you see it coming, because Paul's internal monologue can often be very dark and gruesome. And so like, you kind of know what's gonna happen later on, but it kind of still has a way of surprising you in the way that the violence unfolds. And so like I said, I could not put this book down until I was done because I was just hanging on by a thread trying to figure out like what was going to happen. You know, there was like a looming sense of dread on like every single page. And I think if you've ever had like a toxic friendship or relationship, you will understand and relate to this book a lot. Not to even mention like I talked about it earlier, but the prose in this book is so beautiful. And I could not believe that this was um, Mika's debut novel. Like it, it was, yeah, I, I mean, gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. Um, I, this was, and I'm somebody who highlights my books. Um, I was highlighting almost every page. I mean, it was like every other paragraph just like pulled at your heartstrings. And like, this book was a slow burn, which I know isn't everyone's cup of tea, but I loved it. Um, It kind of felt more real. Some people are wrong. They are wrong. Slow burns are amazing. And it feels more realistic. Um, And it also kind of helps with ki- with Paul and Julian's descent into this madness that they get in. Like, it just felt more raw and real. And like, you felt like you were kind of going insane just like they were particularly paul i will say though um this is my final point like if you plan on reading this book you need to read the trigger warnings and you need to abide by them Uh, especially if you suffer with depression or anxiety like you need to be in a stable headspace because if you are not this book will not be a pleasant ride for you this i can under i could definitely understand this book sending someone into a very bad mental spiral if you read this at the wrong time. Um, Purely because of Paul's internal monologue, because he just lives in this awful, awful headspace. And, you know, like there is, there's a lot of talk about suicide ideation and everything like that. And so while I recommend this book to every single person I know, and I beg them all to read it at the same time, Please make sure that you are feeling uh, okay enough to read this because it it could very easily hurt you or harm you. Um, and I don't want it to do that because, I, like I said, this was my favorite read this year. Um, and I think that it could, if you're not someone who suffers with depression or anxiety or anything, it could really open your eyes to that um, and how you relate to the people around you who do. It can kind of help you see inside their own mind if you have never experienced it, which I think is beautiful. I just caution people. Um, I recommended this book to a really good friend of mine. You know, she has a lot of suicide ideation thoughts. And so I told her, you know, please make sure that you are okay before you open this book because it's not for it's not for the thing. But anyway, it's a really good book. I recommend it. And yeah, that is my favorite book this year. It was absolutely beautiful. Ever since reading it, if we were villains last month or the month before that, 
I've been really meaning to read this book, and I think I might pick it up now even more. Like, I really want to read this book. If We Were Villains was like, you know, when I finished that book, I immediately wanted to pick it back up and read it again because it, it just hit me that hard. This book did the same thing to me. As soon as I was done, I wanted to flip right back to page one and start it all over. And I, I don't know what it is about them that kind of interlaces in my brain that makes them kind of on the same level because I mean there's toxic relationships and stuff and if we were villains but it's like nothing on this level it's pretentious queer people it's the only thing I can think of but yeah it's if you like I don't even really know how to classify this book because it's more like psychological drama than anything if you're someone who likes those kind of things you'll you'll love this it and it has like a four point three on goodreads or something like that's that that's pretty high for goodreads yeah I mean, yeah. Because, you know, you get all kinds of people that give books one stars for funsies. Like, I think everybody here would enjoy it. But it, this is one of those books that was kind of hard for me to put down all my thoughts about it. Because it's a book you have to experience. Because it's just so intense in its content. Yeah, same. You just really had to experience Ruin of Roses. Because it's so intense in its content. <laughs> yeah. So intensely bad. So dark. Yeah. So dark and ugh, grimy. So dark and mysterious. Can you remind me again what the age, like the age of the characters is? I can't remember what you said. Um, they are freshmen in college, so they're like 18, okay, yeah. 19 years that's old. That's what I was. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Which I think is another big reason why. I mean, most people have had a toxic relationship when they were like 18, 19 yeah. years old. I mean, like when you're at that age, it's like a very weird transitional time, and it's a very like. I don't think it really matters who you are or what you're doing or who your friends are. That's a very lonely time for everyone. It is. It is. When you find someone that you really connect with, it is so easy to make like them and everything about them your entire like world and personality. Oh, yeah. And plus, like I said, like Paul is presented as someone who has no friends. It's just him living in his own little world that he lives in so like when he finds this friend like you said it's his only personality like it's julian 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 and julian doesn't really have any friends either because if i remember correctly julian had like just moved to pittsburgh and so like he didn't know anybody you know there are these lonely boys who are queer in the 70s like they find someone that they like and they're gonna yeah you know grip onto them like a leech yeah sounds amazing sounds like a wild like concept for a book of just like somebody who is so so negative as your your narrator your soul like narrator i was just gonna say i think that's why like i remember when we were reading it and i passed on that month me too because i like i was intrigued by the summary but going through the triggers like the trigger warnings i was yeah. like i'm not in a good place to, to read this book right now so it's like it is on my tbr but it's like i'm gonna wait till certain things blow over yeah was that september yeah that was after that was nona month yeah, you knew i wasn't fucking reading anything else <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just MIA. Cause, cause it was so funny because i was telling caitlin i was like oh my gosh i'm so excited for this book because i've been wanting to read it for months and like i'm so glad that it won the poll and she was like i'm gonna apologize in advance because nona comes out right before this and i'm not gonna have any i'm not really <laughs> <laughs> She's like i'm just gonna have to skip it you're gonna have to get over it and i'm like i understand I will read it. I want to read it. I also did not read it in September. I wasn't in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. I was like the only one who did, which is fine. But September was a weird month for all of us, I think. Well, and like, I, it was like we were talking about Juniper and Thorn. Like, um, it had pretty heavy triggers. So I was shocked that it won. But I mean, all, all the books that month had pretty heavy triggers but it was all it was dark academia themed so but yeah i would love if you guys read it but i also understand that it's a hard read and it's it's not something you can just read for fun on the weekend <laughs> say, maybe during the summer when i'm just yes. like non-stop in sunshine. exactly not in the cold <laughs> yeah, dark it, it winter. needs to be dark past 5 30 p.m before yeah. i can take a take a foray back into that kind of that genre of absolutely just general misery yeah December is for smut. Yeah. I've said it before. And I'll say <laughs> it again. I'll say it again. I've been reading nothing but fan fiction. That, that works too. Yeah, I've been on a smut parade. So, but speaking of 
what we've been reading. For 2023 is right around the corner, which is simultaneously good and terrifying. What are we excited for in the new year to come out? Still in air. Still in air. Still in air. <laughs> <laughs> and Mysteries of Thorn Manor. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Mysteries of Thorn Manor. It comes like out in January, January. I think. Yeah, it comes out really soon. Yeah. So. I'm definitely going to do a reread of uh, Sorcery of Thorns for it, by the way. I read it like two years ago. It's been a while. I just read it this year, but I read it earlier on in the year. I think I read it in like March or April, maybe. So I think I am going to do a reread or at least like look through all my like highlights and stuff from it. Because yeah, I I loved that book. It was so good. It was really, really good. I'm also excited for Electo the Ninth. Electo the Ninth, baby. Was that a 2023? Uh, No, I was going to say it was... And now I think it's been pushed back to 2024. No. So what the hell I can't am I supposed wait. to do with my life now? Am I just supposed to keep rereading Gideon, Harrow, and Nona until next the year after next? I y'all, I don't think I sent Kristen a message today that was paragraphs long with like information that I think that I had figured out something, something from something in the book. I am an insane, I am an insane person. She's literally clinically insane. Clinically (laughs) fucking insane at this point. And I'm insane for one, reading it. And two, acknowledging that it it was a genius idea. Thank you. And I keep telling her to continue on these rants because I think they're amazing. Y'all, do you know what got, not announced, but like what appeared on Goodreads recently? Hmm. Dark Rise number two. Yes. <gasps> yeah. August 29th, 2023. Yes. I am really excited for a duet with the Siren Duke. Oh, yes. Yes. I keep forgetting that's coming out. Yeah, I don't exactly remember what month. I think it might be in the summer, but I'm... And on that note, um, The Girl Girls Captive by Katie Robert. Oh, yes. my God. Yes, yes, yes. That comes out in, like, February. I want more of the series. It comes out in February? I think it comes out in February. Yeah, it comes out really soon. I'm so excited. So I'm excited for... Uh, Lady, I know you've read Talia um, Hibbert. But yes. so she's got another one coming out. Ooh. And I just, like... Hers is coming out in January. And it's... So, what is the name of it? She's the one that writes, like, Get a Life, Chloe Brown. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it's this is a new one. It's called Highly Suspicious and Unfairly Cute. But she's just like, <laughs> they're quick. I don't know if they're short or I just read them very quickly. It's always just like good vibes. Yes, <laughs> and, they're very and cute. And like happily ever after. <laughs> and so I just, if you need like a quick pick me up, like those are good. But there is one actually. So this is one I really wanted to bring up because I don't know if um, it's on anyone else's list, but it involves pirates. I'm listening. Tell me more. And it involves a woman pirate who's retired who has to take on like to like settle but then there's like one last job oh yes she's coming for one last job so it's the adventures of amina al sarafi by shannon chakraborty that sounds good yeah so it's coming out in march but anyway an exciting year yeah and I'm hoping that we'll get the third book in the Defy the Night trilogy this year. Uh, yes. A favorite around here. Yes. Probably my favorite read of the year, honestly. Honestly, Defy the Night and Defend the Dawn were very high on my list, too. I think about them every week. Yeah. like Every week. Very underrated series, honestly. The only other book I can think of that I'm excited for is... Um, Gold by Raven Kennedy, which is part of, it's like the fourth book, in, or no, I'm sorry, it's the fifth book in The Plated Prisoner, which is like either loved or hated. I really, really love it. <laughs> um, but I'm excited for that. I think it's going to be the last book in the series, but I, yeah, I was going to ask because there's four of them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is the last one. But yeah, so that's all I like. Oh, and Hellbent by um, Leigh Bardugo, which is the second book in Night, um, Ninth, Ninth House. House. Uh, I did just check Goodreads, and it does still say expected publication fall 2023 for Electo the Ninth. So hopefully I do have a reason to live yes. for this year. I can't wait until 2024 for Electo the Ninth. I, I can't. I can't do it. Can't. And you know what? Kristen double can't because she can't do it for herself, and she definitely cannot listen to me talk for two years. <laughs> <laughs> like we're going to be like round and round and round the same plot points of like, Caitlin, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> That is it for this episode. Thank you all so much for listening. Our next episode will be out Tuesday, January 31st. You can find us at Red in the Dark Pod on Instagram and Tumblr. 
our email is readinthedarkpod at gmail.com if you want to ask a question about any of the books we have discussed on this episode. We also have a book club. You can find us at WordPage Library on Instagram and Tumblr, which will have details on how to join our Discord. Finally, we are hosting some challenges on Storygraph through the book club, which you can find by searching WordPage Library's Book of the Month and WordPage Library's 23 for 2023 in the Challenges section of the app. The two main books we discussed this episode were A Ruin of Roses by K.F. Breen and These Violent Delights by Micah Nemerever. We also mentioned Captive Prince by C.S. Picot, As Yet Unsent by Tamsin Murr, Unequal Affections by Laura S. Ormerston, The Book of Asriel by Amber Nicole, House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J. Moss, Sin and Chocolate by K.F. Breen, The Folk of the Air series by Holly Black, The Villain series by V.E. Schwab, If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio, and Nona the Ninth by Tamsin Murr. The 2023 releases we're excited about are The Stolen Air by Holly Black, Mysteries of Thorn Manor by Margaret Rogerson, Electo the Ninth by Tamsin Murr, Dark Rise 2 by C.S. Picot, Duet with the Siren Duke by Elise Kova, The Gargoyles Captive by Katie Robert, Highly Suspicious and Unfairly Cute by Talia Hibbard, and The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi by S.A. Chakraborty. Keep reading and we'll see y'all next time! Bye. 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 Bye.